So originally I was having some feelings um, when I heard about the uh, death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and our democracy. And I, I wasn't going to record an episode. I was going to take this week off. And I decided not to. So that's why this episode's coming out a little late. And that's why my Twitter has been changing its mind. And the reason I didn't is because I thought about why I'm doing this. And the reason I'm doing this, as much as it is for me to work through my own bullshit, is because there has to be a middle ground. There, there has to be a middle ground between the, the firebrand atheist that goes out and attacks and the nice, cuddly atheist that, quite frankly, doesn't do enough. So this is part of my fight against theocracy. And the parts of theocracy I want to fight against are the misogyny. And they're the oppression. And they're the things that quite frankly, are things that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wanted to fight against. Uh, they're things that she spent her career and her whole adult life fighting against. So it seems disrespectful to take a week off because I'm sad at the loss of a woman I've never met who, damn near as I can tell, never took a week off. So this episode is still coming out, and it's going to keep coming out. Because while I think that Justice Ginsburg and myself, for a very obvious reasons, have different ways of trying to fight against these things that make the world an objectively worse place, I think she'd be on our side. And so I don't want to take a week off of having my voice out there saying, hey, fucking Jim Jordan, Candace Owens, Ken Ham, Ray Comfort, Mike Pence, William Lane Craig, Greg Locke, Coach Dave etc so forth and so on go fuck yourself so this is the apostate seminary welcome to the show the whole earth was of one language and of one speech and the question that hits me here is what language if we're going to approach this as a historical book we need to be able to figure these things out or we can't really call it historical so there's a couple theories i found that are based in the bible uh one is dumber than the other the biblical theories are uh, Adamic language, or Adamic language, uh, and the other is Hebrew. I found these both really interesting in their own ways, so for what I hope are obvious reasons, uh, Adamic language doesn't really hold a lot of weight anymore. As a matter of fact, I usually look for claims on creation, wiki answers, and genesis, reasonable faith, and focus on the family, and they're all quiet on it, but I get to get into magical wackadoos and Mormons to talk about before and after Babel on this episode, so... I'm going to have some fun with it. Starting off with the magical wackadoos. John D. and Edward Kelly. So John D. was a mathematician, was important in English exploration, believed in the occult, and had a great hat. He also schmoozed royalty. He was also the jumping off point for people believing that uh, the language in the garden was the holy and angelic language of Enochian. Now, I used to be really into ceremonial magic and whatnot, and uh, I don't speak Enochian. I tried, but when I ran into the there's a weird melodic part, I'd already progressed far enough into skepticism that I said, fuck it, I'm not that melodic. I hadn't quite gotten to the this is all bullshit part yet, but I was pretty close. And it seems from the sources I have, and what of Edward Kelly and John Dee I've read uh, previously, John Dee really believed his bullshit. He had already started looking for spirits and ghosts at the time, and when you're looking for something like that, it makes you a really good mark. So what had Edward Kelly been doing in that time? He'd been looking for marks. Kelly was convinced, convicted of fraud and reportedly put into the stocks at Lancaster, which led to his ears being cropped and his own cool hat. So normally I don't get into the uh, criminal goings-on of the people that are talked about on this podcast, and that's because I don't usually feel that it's relevant. With this, it's relevant, because this was a scam. So the thing about Enochian is that it's been declared its own language, and it's been uh, found that a person can't invent a new language. But when Donald Laycock looked into it, uh, he there's a, a really great in-depth write-up at uh, Skepsis Articular by Eagle Asprum. Uh, I will be linking it in the show notes. Kelly's Enochian does, lines up less with a language and more with glossolalia, which is speaking in tongues, and that makes a lot more sense. That a fraudster during a time when punishment was cutting off ears to mark them publicly as a fraud wouldn't see the errors of his ways, and that would lead to a variety of cons, and if speaking in tongue lands, especially when compared to the theory, Adamic is the language of angels, and it should be revealed to the court astronomer of Queen Elizabeth, because they asked just right. 
So that's where that came from, is John D. and uh, Edward Kelly were locked away in a room, and Edward Kelly was looking in his hat, reading it off of stones and singing it, or maybe not, or maybe writing it, but probably not, and it wasn't translated. He kind of pulled a Joseph Smith on royalty. Speaking of, on to Mormons. They have no idea, uh, but it definitely was a special language. Except that maybe it wasn't. Uh, apparently, Joe Smith didn't say what it was. But Elder Joseph Fielding Smith did say that Adam and Eve were taught language by the best teacher. This language they were taught apparently continued for thousands of years, totally pure and uncorrupted until the Bible. Which seems insane, because somebody would have come up with a slang term, or something would have been derivative. Uh, and it kind of implies that the Mormons would tend to not believe it's Hebrew, since Hebrew has slang and profanity, and I assume did then, and is, doesn't seem to have the, uh, the stay power of not being totally pure and uncorrupted. However, uh, apparently a few pieces of the Adamic language survive. Uh, this is based on the fact that human beings tend to make the same sort of sounds regardless of how they're arranged, and that's totally in no way because we have a very particular vocal makeup and uh, we're only able to make a limited number of sounds, so those sounds repeat. Also, evidently milk shows up in too many languages for it to be a coincidence. Uh, quote, In another amazing example, certain kernel words, such as milk, have been found to exist in roughly the same form in all of the language families of the world. Uh, this data is believed by some linguists to be remnants of an ancient, ultimate ancient common language that could include all of the known language families. And that is just totally not true. I, they do link to a legitimate article and give corresponding examples, but those are of Sanskrit, English, Greek, and Latin. And four languages doesn't prove anything. Four out of hundreds is not conclusive. For instance, uh, the Yoruba word for milk is wara, Hungarian is Tej, and Indonesian it's Susu, and in Spanish it's Leche, Italian Latte, and French it's Le. Uh, now, unfortunately for their source uh, for this is behind a paywall, and I haven't started asking you guys for money yet, so that'll fuck up my reading it, but from what they quote in their citation, the conclusion is that language originated in one place. And if you're Mormon, that means Adam and Eve, but if you subscribe to reality... It means around a million years ago with either Homo habilis or Homo heidelbergensis. If language did come from one place, I'm putting my money on Homo habilis, as language would have been super instrumental for our expansion out of Africa, and I'm guessing would have actually made it more possible. And in the intervening millions of years, uh, as you heard above before, it became a lot of different languages, because language evolves fairly rapidly. Now, who even says tight anymore other than me? And when was the last time someone who doesn't talk to me regularly heard something described as grody? So, of course, milk and malika don't prove a core proto-language, especially when language proper only began in the last couple hundred thousand years. And, as a matter of fact, in the quote they use in their footnotes, it says, quote, To his, Merritt Rulin's, critics, a few isolated examples do not make a convincing case. End quote. So that seems to fall short. The other option is Hebrew. This one is interesting to me, because not only does this theory fail, it fails in a way that disproves the people who make the claims understand time. So Britannica says about the Hebrew language that Hebrew is, quote, a Semitic language of the northern central, also called northwestern group. It is closely related to Phoenician and Moabite, uh, with which it is often placed by scholars in a Canaanite subgroup. The fact that it is with Phoenician and Moabite and part of the Canaanite subgroup is a fatal blow to the theory, since when the Tower of Babel happened, Canaan didn't exist yet during the times it would have needed to, to have been spoken. You don't even have to go back to Adam for this to fall apart, just to the repopulation. If Hebrew was the language pre-Babel, and Hebrew is a subgroup of the Canaanite language, how did Canaan's grandpa speak it? The vision I have of all this so far is that there was a subgroup of Canaanites called the Hebrews, maybe, who got a language and had a tribal god and got all up on themselves the way tribes with tribal gods do, and people took it way too seriously as history for way too long. But we've been on uh, language for a while. We really should be getting on to Genesis chapter 11, verse 2. And it happened, as they traveled from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. 
And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top reaches to the sky, and let us make ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad on the surface of the whole earth. So the understanding that I have of this, and uh, Flavius Joseph, Josephus, uh, and I'm going with him because I have his books, and I'm going to use them if I'm uh, going to own them. And he's also very frequently referenced by apologists. He agrees with me. It's that they wanted to have a sort of home base and form a nation. They wanted some large structure so that when they went out exploring, it would give them a waypoint. I don't have an issue with this as an idea. It makes sense that early people, after they figured out brickmaking and masonry, but not necessarily navigation, would want large structures to be able to find their way home. I will go that far, and I'm not going any further. The issue is that it implies that God didn't want them to have this nation, and I'm going to need an explanation as to why. Otherwise, there has to be an argument made that make a name for yourself meant become famous and go down in history, and that seems unlikely. Bible Ref does offer the idea that they were trying to make a strong defensible tower and city so that their enemies wouldn't want to attack them, which still seems really legit as a historical reason to do that, and I'm confused why God wouldn't want it. Bible Ref goes on to say that it was because they were self-glorifying and wanted to be self-reliant, and I'm still very confused as to how those are really all that bad. So, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that humankind was building, and he said, look, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. So now nothing which they plan to do will be too difficult for them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Oh shit, they're building a big thing. Uh, quick, fuck with them. We can't have them making big things. What if they get up high enough to see the Earth's curvature? What? This book was being written around 500 BC, and the Greeks were figuring that out while it was being written? Shit! When I was a kid, I was taught the tower was to go up and touch God. To become godlike and be able to just waltz into heaven. And it turns out they just didn't want to get lost, and God is a fucking prick. So as to the veracity of the claim, the Tower of Babel hasn't been found. Although biblical literalists and answers in Genesis seem to think they've made a case for it being in the Kaaba River Triangle in Syria, and... I'm looking at that while I write out this script, and not seeing anything tower-like at all. As to the historicity of it, uh, everything I find deals with humans building the towers to rebel against God, as though God is recorded as having told people not to build big buildings, or that's reflected in the source texts they're supposedly using to drive their search, and relying on the above ideas for the origin of language. For me, that hurts their scientific credibility enough to not spend a lot of time with them, if you can't read your fucking Bible or apply very basic concepts of just time to your research, I'm not going to trust you to accurately interpret data. Then the Lord scattered them abroad from there on the surface of all the earth, so they ceased building the city. Then we should have some kind of remnant of the city or something that we can find and as referenced above. I can't find any evidence of any of this from reputable sources. People think this is history, but we have found things from then, and that are older than then, and if it were that big, it would have been mentioned elsewhere a lot. We would have records of people going, and then we went to that big fucking ruin, or something, but there's nothing. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Also a dick move. You start off in your city, with your tower, you just want to be able to find your way home, and all of a sudden you're in fucking Maine. That is ridiculous. It's just making God out to look like an asshole and no kind of moral authority on anything. Also, the Hebrew verb Bilal apparently means to confuse. So, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and became the father of Arpachshad two years after the flood. And I'm skipping from 1111 to 1118 because it's just a repeat of what I said on the last episode. So, Peleg lived 209 years, he became the father of Reu, and he fathered sons and daughters. Reu lived 132 years and became the father of Surug. Reu lived 207 years after he became the father of Surug and fathered sons and daughters. Surug lived 130 years, became the father of Nathor. Lived 230 years after he became the father of Nahor and fathered sons and daughters. Nahor lived 79 years and became the father of Torah. Nahor lived 129 years after he became the father of Torah and fathered sons and daughters. 
Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Naor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Aran, and Aran became the father of Lot. And Aran died before his father Terah in his, the land of his birth, ur which is the uh, modern city of Tal al makhyar or Mugher, which is about 200 miles southeast of Baghdad. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. Incidentally, if you keep this as a family tree, and I am, you may notice that Milka is the daughter of Haran, and that Haran and Nahor are the children of Terah, which means that Nahor married his niece and had Iska. They will immediately not matter. And Sarai was barren. She had no child. And this will happen when your body doesn't make babies. And Terah took Abram his son, Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son of Abram's wife, and with them he set out from ur Kazdim to go into the land of Canaan, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. I'm assuming he died in the corpse of his child, because that last half of the chapter was fucking boring, and that really spices it up. Uh, and that's Genesis 11. Moral of the story, go ahead and fuck your niece, but don't big, build big buildings. People who can't have kids tend to not have kids... That's a terrible moral lesson. No wonder the Bible Belt has niece fucking and the godless Democrat cities have tall buildings and schools. Should have known all along. On to Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Go out from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Never mind the people living there, which would become a strong tradition of religious zealots who want to send us back to the fucking Bronze Age. And I will make you a great nation. And I'll do it with America's help, and the man of fiery orange hair will come and pretend to make peace between countries that aren't at war while you commit a genocide, and anybody who questions it will be labeled anti-Semitic. And I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt, and then through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram left, and as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, uh, which is modern-day Haran in Turkey. Abram took Sarai his wife, Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had accumulated, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, because this is a moral fucking guidebook and you acquire people when you're acting fucking morally. And they left to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to the land of Canaan, which is a region populated around Jericho in the Stone Age. Uh, that doesn't really mean anything because it's less a country and more a regional group. Uh, sort of like when we refer to ancient Greece, apparently. Like, yeah, Greece, but also Athens was a state, and Sparta was a state, and Lesbos, and Macedonia, and so on. So, Greece was a region and general culture, but you have a lot of different groups in that. Unless I'm mistaken, Canaan and a lot of ancient nations, including the Jews later in the Bible, were kind of like that, and it isn't accurately represented in the Bible. Color me shocked. And Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem a Palestinian city between Mounts Gerizim and Ebal, which made it pretty important, and this comes back up. To the Oak of Moreh, that's a tree. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land, and that seems to be possibly any number of diff different ethnic groups, uh, but there's a non-zero chance that it's the Palestinians. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I will give this land to your offspring. He built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. He left from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, which is either the Arab West Bank village Baitin or El Buray, uh, with the name currently applied to the settlement Bait El as of 1977, which for no goddamn reason Wikipedia phrases 10 years after the 1967 Six-Day War, the biblical name was applied to the Israeli settlement Bait El, constructed adjacent to Baitin, as fucking fancy fucks talking all fucking fancy and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and I on the east, which is possibly Etel. Uh, there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. And Abram traveled on, continuing toward the Negev, that's a desert that takes up the south part of Israel, and there was a famine in the land. So Abram went to, into Egypt to sojourn there, because the famine was severe in the land, and presumably they had food in Egypt. It happened, when he had come near to enter Egypt, that he said to Sarai his wife, Look, I know what a beautiful woman you are. It will happen, when the Egyptians will see you, that they will say this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. That's, that's because she's property, you see, so they'll just mug him. 
Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Would you let someone fuck your wife so you could live? And I don't even understand how this actually helps the situation. Like, they walk in and they're like, oh, that's his wife, stab, stab, stab. But while they're stab, stab, stabbing, she's like, no, that's my brother. And they're like, oh, well, that's fine then. Uh, he still owns you because this is Bible and he's your brother. Stab, stab, stab. It happened that when Abram had come into Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh saw her and praised her to the Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into the household of Pharaoh. He dealt well with Abram for her sake, and he acquired sheep, cattle, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkey, donkeys, and camels, because she's property, you see, so the Pharaoh will just buy her with other people who are also property, because this is how people think the country should be fucking run. But God plagued Pharaoh and his house with great and grievous plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Fucking what? They show up in this place, and Abram's like, Hey, you know how you're my property? Be my sister property, so they don't mug me for my property, and I'll be making a shit ton of money off of your existence, so just shut the fuck up about it. And then God's all like, Bitch, what are you doing? That's insane. This makes sense to people. There are people who say this makes sense to them, and they're fucking up our fucking fucking everything. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? How the fuck did he find out? Oh, was the last first foreshadowing? Are the plagues because the Pharaoh was told he was all up in Abram's wife and she told him because she's not comfortable being used like that? Because, uh, fuck that. Fuck both these scenarios. This isn't a situation anybody should have ever been put in, and all it goes to show is that our ethics and our morals as people have gone from the Bible, the Old Testament Bible, the, the particularly rapey people or property one, all the way up to where we are now. And this started with Plato. This started before the Bible. We're so much fucking smarter now. We're smarter than this, all of us. So angry right now. Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now, therefore, look, your wife is before you. Take and go. I have to say, Based on that, like, the Pharaoh purchased her, but comparative to the time, if we're really being honest, if we're really taking this seriously, we aren't, but we're pretending we are, the Pharaoh is the good guy here. Like, the, the Pharaoh was following customs that are deeply immoral and monstrous now. The idea of buying people's sister from them with, with other people and camels is horrible. But he found out and went, hey, what the fuck, bro? Just get out of here. So the pharaoh commanded men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all his possessions, which, you know what, I, I have to assume includes the people. And that's chapter 12. So the moral of the story is let them fuck your wife. She's property anyway. Just don't let her tell anybody. Just God's words, not mine, the fucking asshole. Uh, Sarai is going to be a piece of shit too here in a few chapters, so she'll, she's going to make it hard to feel too bad. So we're at the end of the episode, and real quick before I go, there's going to be some changes to how long the episodes are and how much are covered because I did some math and at the pace this is going we'll be through the Bible in 22 years. Uh, I'm going to be tightening up the schedule, I'm going to be lengthening the episodes a little bit and they may start coming more frequently depending on how school goes because we're going to need to get out through this shit but it's important that we do and it's important that we do together. All fucking three of you and I love you all and I have been uh, the high apostate Phineas 12 gauge and one day I am going to change that name, but I'm going to need my trainer to give me a piece of rare candy so that I can evolve into my next form. Uh, as always, the email is poweredbyapostasy at gmail.com. If I say something that you know better than I do, you're an expert of some kind and you want to correct me, or you just like something, or you particularly dislike something, or you want me to delete your email for being a fucking prick or evangelizing to me, in the Twitter is the letter X, Essential Panda. In case I've missed something, or you want to get in contact, or hook up on social media, or, or you just want me to mute you because you're an evangelizing prick. And if you could do me a personal favor in lieu of five-star reviews, or sharing it where nobody's going to see it, if you want to share the episode somewhere people will see them, or just tell your friends, hey, this guy's fucking doing the homework, please do. That would really help me out a lot. I do want to make a career out of this someday. I'm also planning on releasing some apostate-themed masks uh, on TeePublic, so keep an eye out for those. I will be making notifications and updates in the Twitter. I love you. Stay safe. Fight the good fight.